around uh, during all this uh, rain and uh, the difficulties in uh, with the traffic. Uh, so uh, at this session, uh, the discussion is around uh, testimonies, trauma, and uh, torture. And uh, as you know very well already from the schedule, we have with us uh, three, four actually. We have three papers uh, will be presented by uh, four authors. Uh, so the the presentations uh, will last uh, 20 minutes. We'll try to be strict with that in order to have the time later on to discuss uh, about uh, on, on the presentations. So first of all, I will give uh, the speech to uh, Ms. Katerina Stefatos and Ms. Georgia uh, Sarianidou Papakopoulou. And uh, the presentation, the title of the presentation is The Greek Military Dictatorship and the po Poisonous knowledge, knowledge of Torture and Trauma. <coughs> organizing committee of the conference. I would like to personally thank Nani Panoria and Kostis Kornelis for their support. Um, and of course, my deepest thank you and appreciation go to Georgia Sariyanidu, Papadopoulou, and Aspasia Kara for not only entrusting me with their memories and truths, but also for their endless patience and friendship. I feel privileged and grateful to have them in my life. Uh, so the title of our paper is The Greek Military Dictatorship and the Poisonous Knowledge of Torture and Trauma. The paper is based on a series of ongoing conversations and interviews with the junta political dissidents and educators Georgia, Sayyanidu, Papadopoulou, and Aspasia Kara. Sayyanidu and Kara's testimonies of torture and incarceration were smuggled while both of them were still detained and were submitted as evidence of the systematic violation of human rights to the Council of Europe and the International Red Cross. <coughs> Our paper draws from semi-structured and unstructured interviews with Sarianido and Cara, public and unpublished testimonies of torture, as well as testimonies and interviews with other human dissidents and archival materials. Especially Amnesty International's archive, Lake for Democracy, at uh, the King's College London Archives. Set against a uh, transnational and comparative background, our presentation will set light on the ways in which the gendered, corporeal, and discursive threats of tra traumatic lived experiences and testimonies of gender violence, torture, and solitary confinement are often not fully unraveled within official processes of history making. I will continue with some information on the arrest and detention of Yorgia Sarianidu and Kara, and some of the information and also on our PowerPoint. On August 24, 1968, Yorgia Sarianidu, at the time a 21-year-old student in the School of English uh, Language and Literature at the Arizona University of Thessaloniki, was asked by the neighborhood police officer to join him at the local police station uh, for a few minutes. This few minutes um, ended up to three years of political incarceration, 10 months of which in solitary confinement uh, at the transfer division, um, I'm not sure if that's the correct translation, um, until her trial in June 1969, where she was sentenced to uh, three and a half years. Upon her sentencing, she was transferred to the Aver prison along with her friends and comrades, Aspasia Cara and Laura Kulmanda. She was released from the Avera prison on April 21st, 1971. Undoubtedly, her experience of political imprisonment was marked by her isolation while in solitary confinement, the horrifying conditions in her cell, the mice, the dirt, as well as the cohabitation with common law prisoners, which she describes both as fruitful and challenging. Aspasia Gara was 36 years old at the time of her arrest, a lecturer in philology and a member of the city council of Thessaloniki. She was arrested by the security police of Thessaloniki on August 25, 1968, and was immediately brought to the ground floor of the 3rd Army Corps, a building where the Central Intelligence Agency Keep had its offices. 
In the evening of September 2nd, 1968, her horrifying torture began. She was detained for 17 days of the 3rd Army Corps before her transfer and detention in strict isolation of the security police. Two months later, at the end of October, she was transferred to the reform prisons where she joins her comrades and friends, Dora, Eli, and Ismini. As Pasia was reunited with Georgia the Metabohon right before the trial. Both describe it as a particularly moving moment as Aspasia survived torture and Georgia 10 months solitary confinement. After their trial, that lasted two weeks, and their sentencing, Aspasia was sentenced to uh, 10 and a half years. They were transferred to the Avera prisons. Aspasia was released from Corrida Law's prison in August 1973 under the general amnesty. After several discussions, interviews, Skype meetings, copious emails exchanges with Sariani, who often acting as the mediator, consensuous and patient, Kara decides that it's time to share with me some form of written testimony. Close to two weeks later, in June of 2019, Sariani shared 1,300 pages of Kara's testimony. What initially strikes me is the way her lived experience of torture and terror are written and detailed, a testimonial narrative going back and forth between a detailed documentation with bullet points, subsections, numbered and categorized, and a horrifying revisiting of the various forms of torture and dehumanization she experienced. What her narration reveals as do memoirs and testimonies of other hunted dissidents are the following two points. First, the scientific execution of torture and its gender and sexual delineations, and two, the instrumentalization of the gender and disabled body in the context of torture. Both as vulnerable, weak, and feminine, hence where political identity seem unthinkable, but simultaneously deviant and threatening, where torture is called to carry out the labor of normalizing the revelation. Kara is reconceptualized by her torturers as deviant and threatening. Characterized as a viper due to her political identity, already a woman political figure in Thessaloniki's political scene as a member of the uh, city council, uh, a Medusa archetype of sorts, while at the same time her disability from a young age as a result of polio demarcates the gender and political body with an additional difference. The blurring of the political and the gender is omnipresent in torture, in confinement, in the everyday activities and prison realities. Gender-based threats and the sexualization of the body become almost quotidian. And in the words of the anthropologist Begana Exaga, political violence performed on and from the body cannot escape the meaning of sexual difference. Women forced to use a toilet in the presence of guards, threats and rape rehearsals in Kara's words, sexual torture, deprivation of water and sleep, in some cases up to three months. Both Sariyalido and Kara describe the political and sexual mortification of returning the bloody clothes and underwear, either due to torture or menstruation or both, while their interrogations were displaying and unfolding them in search of hidden notes in front of their mothers. So he neither recalls the panopticon gaze of the male guard in prison cells, while the noise of his keys return upon her release every time her husband opens the apartment door. Kara, as other political prisoners, has reluctantly shared the details showcasing the instrumentality and the lingering effects of the torture she experienced in the context of interrogation, especially that of electroshock. In the letters and testimonies, including the Black Book, the Greek Junta uh, stands accused of 1971, smuggled to the International Red Cross Committee and the Council of Europe, Kara, as other political detainees do, document the torture, the human rights violations, and the terrorization of the experience while detained. As former political detainees have revealed, Pretius Corvetis, among others, torture during the military dictatorship took the form of a machinery of terror, a liturgy of punishment, in the words of Foucault. The scientific nature of torture and its theatricality, the music, as Anna Papaitis' research demonstrates, the performativity of the torturers themselves, the sites of torture, the available medical surgical tools strategically visible, the presence of doctors in their real machines or truth serums, as Karen Corovesis described, are all aiming at the transformation of the living, tortured body into a discursive text through docility. And I'm quoting to Cohen B. Bakai we should here. The Conor Exada, in reference to the dirty protests of women political prisoners in Northern Ireland, 
argues that political violence predicated on the bodies of women cannot be considered as an addendum to violence perform performed on men's bodies. Cara was told that she would be tortured as harshly as men, despite her gender and disability. As he was dragged in a makeshift torture sack at the Third Army Corps in Thessaloniki, she vividly remembers what she describes as a bar that was on the right, where her soon-to-be tortured were drinking, dressed in civilian clothes, in suits and ties, and what she characterizes as a Nazi doctor, presumably with glassy eyes, carrying a stethoscope and a blood pressure meter, asking about her health before authorizing her torture. He takes notes on the unaffected healthy parts of her body due to polio. Soon her head is covered with a blanket, sweating while her body shivers, tied on a bed in a Christ-like position. In Kara's case, both the presence of the doctor and the expertise of the torturers was instrumental, as the electroshock was not only aiming at her speaking or giving information in the context of interrogation, but also the penalization of the unrepentant political and gender body for transgressing gender norms and expectations, but was also aiming at the absolute destruction of a body already suffering, otherized because of its always there disability. The electroshock was targeting the healthy parts of her body, the ones not affected by her disability, such as her navel, not allowing any parts of her body to remain untouched, leaving there, lying there, half naked, half alive. The targeting of the navel was not accidental. Kara was electroshocked with the navel in order not to give birth to any communist children. In these instances, the female body is politicized and simultaneously depoliticized. Stripped of motherhood and deprived of its reproductive capacity, it is ultimately sexualized. Concurrently, the sexualized, gendered, and political body, which cannot be perceived as maternal, is transformed through abuse sexual mortification, hunger and fear into a docile body and a spectacle. Concurrently, both Kara and Sarianid are in agreement that even though there are differences between their high-ranking officials, the specially tra trained torturers and the guards, they refuse to link hate towards them, underlying this often troubling and complicated relationship that Nani Panuri analyzes as the complicatedness of the tortured, intersubjective relationship between the police and the torturers and the snitches. Karenz and Yanidu mentioned that they were often providing assistance with the homework of their guards, children, or that they were in some cases refusing acts of kindness by the guards that may lead to their supervisor's penalization. Kara mentioned uh, in her interview that she even feels sorry for her torturers, and in a way echoing what Mr. Nestor said on Thursday, that he, um, that he, uh, he doesn't, um, uh, that he shares uh, what has been mentioned by Kara in terms of how he feels about his tortures, accusing the state and not his actual tortures. Um, when during our interview I mentioned the case of uh, an Argentinian female political prisoner of the ESMA, the Navy mechanics, uh, the Navy School of Mechanics torture camp, where uh, approximately 5,000 detainees were imprisoned and tortured, and only 150 survived. Um, that young student who was detained and tortured reached out for her torturer's hand during torture, seeking for human contact. Kara reflects on her own lived experience. How can another human being do this to you? How is it possible? We have heard of torturers, read about them, heard about them from our fathers who were exiled in Macronus and Jura, but we have not heard of electroshock. But now you're experiencing torture. It is happening. You are tied, your face covered. I tried to apply some type of hierarchical order, classify what was crossing through my mind during the electroshock, and how I managed to resist and survive. There were two parallel components that I was unable to classify. The first one was the objective to endure and not to give or reveal any names. The second, and equally important, to prove to my torturers that the electroshock was not enough. It was not effective they would have to invent something else. I wanted them to feel that they lost, to feel disappointed, and to prove that human dignity cannot be taken away. The next day of her torture, after being dragged to her cell, Kara began bleeding heavily. Her white summer dress was soon covered in blood. For two months, she would be held in captivity without being allowed to wash herself, with limited access to food and drinking water. Close to 50 years later, Kara refuses to drink the minimum three glasses of water recommended by doctors. 
My body doesn't ask for drinking water, she told me. Would she connect to the three month water deprivation, often liking even saliva while incarcerated? And yet she writes, I assumed for a minute that they did it in order for me to hate my body and give them my soul. Maybe, but I love my body even more because it endured. Our objective is to revisit and situate the gender trauma of political incarceration and torture against the backdrop of the historical and political moment of the Greek case, the birth of a human rights discourse, and all this within the analytical framework of traditional justice. Concurrently, the often fragmented and liminal narratives and testimonies of female political dissidents need to be situated within the painful struggle to turn their trauma into narrative. The Greek case is not an exception in terms of how catastrophic events and the lived experiences of the subaltern and the silenced are incorporated into or excluded from acts of public remembrance, collective memory, and the official construction of history. Nonetheless, we need to underline the absence of a discourse on the afterlife of sexual torture and gender-related trauma, which bars the gender after effects of trauma from being incorporated into a memory archive, as Chris Cornettis and I have argued elsewhere. By engendering testimonies and trauma during and in the aftermath of the military regime, we're hoping to help think critically about silence as a survival mechanism and a new form of language in opposition to a singular, linear, often sensational narrative that prioritizes victimization and relies on spectacularized forms of primarily sexual violence heroic, usually male, narrations, and quantification paradigms with Sally Engel Mary described as the seductions of quantification. Sarianidou, during our first interview, stressed the need to move away from the heroic narratives that are unable or unwilling to incorporate the subtle states of trauma. Based on the stories and lived experiences of Cara and Sanayanido, we are addressing the materiality of the trauma of torture and incarceration as mirrored in the corporeal, the gender body, the everyday and its disruption, the domestic, as it develops in its latency, its tangibility, and literality. And I'm relying on Kathy Garuth here. By doing so, our aim is to set light on the ways that this traumatic knowledge, what the anthropology of Vina Das describes as poisonous knowledge, is an alternative knowledge that is not accessible in ordinary circumstances or that derives from the hidden realities of violence due to war or mass atrocities and catastrophic events, where the past returns not only or necessarily as traumatic memory but as poisonous knowledge, and that can be reclaimed by women, survivors of torture, political violence, political imprisonment, and otherwise socially marginalized groups. As the question, what happens to the self in the aftermath of violence where the gender and political body and trauma cannot find a place remains. We approach the fragmented narratives not as vocalizations of fragmented selves, but as a new crafting of the self, in the words of Gabiba Baderu, the South African poet and academic, which is leading to new forms of, of agency and visibility. Drawing on Dionne Million and her analysis of first-person narratives of Native women in Canada to talk about sexual torture, disability, and corporeality, intimacy, sexuality, and affect in the aftermath of state terror while sheltering political subjectivities is politically unthinkable. However, the wounded bodies, now aging but still defiant, are strategically revisiting the fragmented narratives, putting the pieces together while relying on long-standing friendships and solidarity, the bodily memory of being with others, as Fina Das has described it and at the same time, impact political identities. They are rendering reticence, silence, corporeality, domesticity, and intimacy within the often unintelligible and unshareable traumatic experience of surviving as female dissidents the unimaginable. Kara's bloody white dress in the aftermath of her torture and Sarianita's remnants of a walk with her fiance in rainy Thessaloniki which acted as a coping mechanism during her solitary confinement, will always return to remind us of survival and resistance and the importance of a testimonial community, as testimony is not possible in a void, as Susanna Feldman and Dory Loeb have argued. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katerina Stefatos. Uh, first of all, I, I 
forgot to present uh, uh, who exactly the speakers were. Katerina Stefatos is a visiting, visiting assistant professor in women, gender, and sexuality in the International Interior Studies at Kalamazoo College in Michigan, while Georgia Sarianidou Papadopoulou is a former junta political detainee, and this is an educator and a member of SFEA. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation, especially. Η χνηλάτησε, άγγιξε, κατανόησε σε βάθο το τραύμα, τον πόνο, την πίκρα και την οργή μα. Ο κύριο Διαμαντούρο ε, επεσήμανε χθε ότι ακόμη δεν υπάρχει, ένας, ε, ενιολο, υπάρχει ένα ενιολογικό κενό για τον προσδιορισμό του πολίτη. Φανταστείτε τη δεκαετία του 60, όπου η, η νομοθεσία απαγόρευε στις γυναίκες να αποφασίσουν για το πού ακριβώς θα ζήσουν και σε ποιο ακριβώς σχολείο θα πάνε τα παιδιά τους ε, και πώς θα αποφασίσουν για τη ζωή τους και δίνανε και φρίκα, υπήρχε το φρικάγον και όλα αυτά. Με, με αυτή την κοινωνική πρακτική, α, όταν βρεθήκαμε κρατούμενες, τι αντιμετώπιση είχαμε. Και αυτό φαίνεται χαρακτηριστικά από μερικά περιστατικά. Όταν ήμουνα στο κρατήριο και η μητέρα μου ζήτησε να φέρνω έναν γιατρό γιατί είχα πυρετό, αυτό το ζήτησε βέβαια από τη στρατιωτική διοίκηση, τη είπαν τι να τον κάνει το γιατρό. Ας φύγει κιόλα, τι θα την κάνετε. Λέει, μα κόρη μου είναι, την πήρατε από το σπίτι, πώς μου λέτε έτσι. Μα τη λέει η κυρία μου, θα ήταν καλύτερα για εσά να την είχαμε πάρει από τον δρόμο, γιατί τότε είχατε ελπίδα να τη σώσετε. Τώρα εκεί που έβλεξε, δεν θα τη σώσετε ποτέ. Οι γυναίκε, όχι μόνο οι κρατούμενε, οι οποίε ήμασταν λίγε βέβαια, ε, στι φυλακέ Αβέρο που ήμασταν όλε οι γυναίκε από όλη την Ελλάδα, ήμασταν 20 ώρε και όλε. Βέβαια και άλλε συνελήφθησαν, βασανίστηκαν και ελευθερώθηκαν. Εμεί περάσαμε από το στρατοδικείο και μείναμε εκεί. Ήταν από πίσω. Ήταν στα βέρο του 120. Στα βέρο, στην αρχή. Εσεί είσαστε στον Κορυδαλό, πολύ αργότερα. Είχα Εγώ πήγε... ήμουν στο Άβρο. Είχαμε φύγει με το 228, το με τον νόμο του Παπαδόπου του. Το Παπαδόπου. ξέρω, ήταν και η Αφρούλα τότε ναι. από Θεσσαλονίκη. Ακριβώ, μαζί Οπότε, με την Αφρούλα. Το 69 που πήγα, ε, ναι. μέχρι Αλλά... το. Ναι, μέχρι Εμείς το. Εμεί είχαμε βγει με το 228 και βγήκαμε τον Απρίλιο του 1968. <coughs> <coughs> Γιατί είπατε ότι ήταν 20 μόνο. Δεν είμαστε όταν, ήμουν, όταν πήγα εγώ, είπα. Όταν το 69 πήγα στο Κορυδαλό, ναι. μέχρι ναι. που έφυγα Έτσι. και μετά στη συνέχεια, στη συνέχεια πήγα στο Κορυδαλό, ήταν γύρω στι 20 γυναίκε, όλε και όλε. Όχι, δεν έφυγα. Εγώ απολύθηκα λίγε μέρε πριν πάμε στο Κορυδαλό. Ναι. Λοιπόν, ε, Η, η άλλη άποψη που, κοινωνική που εκφράστηκε στην περιπέτειά μας ήταν αυτό που είπε ο πρόεδρος του στρατοδικείου. Όταν επεσήμανε ο δικηγόρος ότι «Μα δεν έχετε στη δικογραφία κάποια στοιχεία τα οποία να αναχοποιούν την ε, Σαριγιαννή του, γιατί τη δικάζετε» ο πρόεδρος είπε ο στρατοδίκης ε, κύριε Συνήγορα, δεν ξέρετε ότι οι σκέψει δικάζονται. Αυτό ήταν. Γι' αυτό ήμασταν στο δικαστήριο, διότι οι σκέψει δικάζονταν και το είπε αυτό λεξί. Αφού λοιπόν η, 
εκλεκτή ε, ομιλητέ εδώ απαρίθμησαν και μια σειρά κινημάτων του εξωτερικού. Εγώ αναρωτιέμαι πού ήταν τα κινήματα των δικηγόρων που αρνούνταν να έρθουν ω υπερασπιστέ, ζητούσαν πάρα πολλά λεφτά αλλά αρνούνταν. Πού ήταν ε, ε, τα, τα κινήματα των γιατρών, γιατί οι γιατροί συνάδελφοί του επιβλέπαν τα βασανιστήρια. Και πού ήταν οι καθηγητέ μα, γιατί με το που μα συλλάβανε, πριν ακόμη μα δοθεί το ε, κατηγορητήριο και πριν παραπεθούμε στη δίκη, ήρθε η ειδοποίηση ότι η σύγκριτο του Πανεπιστημίου μα απόβαλε διαπαντό από το Πανεπιστήμιο. Οι δάσκαλοί μας δεν αντέδρασαν σε όλες τις πρακτικές. Μόνο αυτά ήταν η πληροφορία. Κάνω πώς σε ευχαριστώ. is Sound Escapes of Torture and Hunt Interrogation Techniques in the Legacy of the Greek Case. Uh, Anna is currently a Marie Curie Fellow at Pantheon University, examining the use of music in detention during the Greek Civil War. Thank you, Anna. Can we get the PowerPoint on? I'd just like to thank profoundly Katerina Irina and uh, Georgia for this paper both for the theoretical vigor, but also the moving um, statement of the area. So thank you very much. I'm honored to follow you. Okay. Right. The military dictatorship in Greece holds a unique place in the study of torture. It provides rare insights of scientific torture practices emerging in the Cold War period through testimonies of victims, but also perpetrators in legal proceedings during and after the dictatorship. First, the Greek case in Strasbourg, and later, in 1975, the so-called torturous trials in Greece. This paper investigates enhanced interrogation techniques with regard to the definition of torture in the Greek case, focusing on purpose, and later, in the case of Ireland against the UK, focusing on the severity and cruelty of suffering. In exploring the use of music and sound in the detention centers of the military dictatorship as a forerunner of practices used in the so-called war on terror, the paper shows how both these definitions misapprehend the scientific kind of torture based on new approaches to pain. The January 1968 Amnesty Report, written by James Beckett and Anthony Mareko, distinguishes between physical and non-physical torture. Giving equal attention to psychological torture, it grasped to, to an extent the change in the technologies of terror taking place at the time. The report explains, I'm not sorry, sound features in the form of the screams of other detainees being tortured. The report explains how this method was damaging for detainees, causing a number of nervous breakdowns, something corroborated to me in interviews I conducted with political prisoners. Sound is encountered in more detail in testimonies of survivors for the European Commission of Human Rights in Strasbourg, as well as in the first torturous trials. Reading closely testimonies from these legal proceedings, but also listening to interviews uh, I conducted and reading autobiographical writings, a differentiated picture emerges of sound, silence, even music constituting an attack to the sensorium and contributing to a total loss of control. The methods vary depending on the detention centers, their architectural design, but also the training of officers, be they from the security forces or the Greek military police. It is therefore difficult to establish a unified or exhaustive picture of torture and interrogation techniques. And as it is usually the case with torture, um, this, our images that we have, or our understanding is usually a fragmented one. However, a close reading of testimonies begins to illuminate particular practices. Here, I will briefly refer to three facilities in Athens and Piraeus, drawing on testimonies I collected in 2012 and archival sources. 
One of the most pronounced examples of the use of sound in the Greek case is the electric bell inside the isolation cells of security police at the Piraeus headquarters. According to the Strasbourg report, all witnesses described a bell inside their cell in close proximity to the door, playing loudly for hours on end, effectively preventing them from sleeping. The use of the bell was corroborated to me by Dora in 2012. Arrested in December 1967, she was held in isolation for approximately 40 days and was exposed to the continuous sound of the bell. Although the regime denied these allegations, the investigating commission found unmistakable traces of a bell and its wiring having been removed from the place where it was said to have been. Junta officers did not even try to plaster or paint the walls where the bell was torn away, they noted. Our second stop is the Athens Security Forces headquarters in Bubulina Street, which presents us with a different sonic environment. Survivors describe detention conditions marked by extreme differences. Isolation took place in the basement, in darkness, and imposed silence. This was interchanged with interrogation and torture on the terrace. A small room up on the terrace where brutal torture took place accompanied by the motorized sound of the so-called motorcycle described by many survivors and the so-called gong. According to the subcommission's report, they were unable to find any machine producing the motorcycle sound other than the ventilator in the courtyard. They did, however, note a cauldron or metal sink which sounded like a loud gong when beaten upon. The use of sound has also been reported in the training center of military police, Gessa. Telling is a testimony of Major Pneumatikos in Strasbourg, who was taken there on the 3rd April 1968. Pneumatikos testified to the sound of a Harley motorcycle, repeatedly, repeated continuously for hours, and to soldiers making terrible noise, banging metal canes and sticks of metal, among others. Their aim was not just sleep deprivation. Sound created a constant atmosphere of fear, anxiety and helplessness, rendering detainees unable to resist through thinking. The most scientific torture methods of the period were used in the isolation cells of the Special Interrogation Unit of Greek Military Police, which I will refer to as EAD SA. They included continuous standing in an empty room, sometimes on one foot, sleep deprivation, beatings, forced singing or dancing, loud sounds like the ones described above, humiliations, food and drink deprivation. According to testimonies I collected from prisoners from the student movement and the Navy, Navy movement, as well as an ASA soldier, this ritual also included continuous music. Survivors remember popular songs, hits of the time, played continuously in a loop from loudspeakers. They all recall the song Tarzan by left-wing composer Yanis Markopoulos, which was a big hit of the time. The lyrics of all songs mentioned were understood as deeply ironic in the context of torture and interrogation. For one of my interviewees, Tarzan was like the Chinese drop, grating on the nerves, not letting them sleep. All of my interviewees who recall music were based at the Adisa in 1973 from March to, um, to July. They might be related, this might be related to the fact that the survivors I spoke were held at the Adessa either on its early days or in 1973. The use of music in 1973 could also be due to the officers in charge. For instance, we know from testimonies of former Guantanamo detainees, the music was introduced there when General Miller was appointed and was played during his placement there. Selective memory may also be due to the traumatic nature of these events, an issue encountered in research on music and torture in Nazi extermination camps. This is a point also made to me by a SAS soldier X. He told me, quote, the music that people usually refer to who were violated by the regime was played during their torture. When logic and emotion are blinded by pain, they heard this music. Some of them could trace it. Perhaps others in their pain were not able to understand what it was. End of quote. What emerges is the consistent use of sound in detention and interrogation in these three important detention centers. Indeed, Greece is one of the first documented examples we have internationally for the use of sound and music in particular in the 1960s and early 70s. This is a time when sound emerges as an integral part of coercive interrogation techniques based on psychological research. <coughs> 
Sponsored by the CIA in the context of its mind control program or brainwashing, it was conducted in universities in the UK, U USA and Canada in the 1950s and McGill University is the most infamous of them all. I mean the most known, I should say. Findings were codified in the CIA interrogation manual Kuberg, released in 1963 and disseminated to all allied, country, to, to allied countries, sorry, often through aid programs. Kubrick's focus on loss of control through the manipulation of the detainee's environment, uh, creating, sorry, Kubrick's focus on loss of control through the manipulation of the detainee's environment, <coughs> creating intolerable situations and disrupting patterns of time, uh, space, and sensory perception, continued to form the basis of CIA manuals in later decades a testimony to their success in breaking prisoners and evading international law is the fact that they were used more recently by the US interrogators in the so-called war on terror. Understanding them is key to understanding torture before examining legal definitions and their shortfalls. According to Cooper, loss of control is essential in generating, altering, or halting human behavior, be it with physical or psychological means, in order, quote, to ensure compliance with directions. Control of an interrogatee can rarely be established without control of his environment, end of quote. Exposure to unpredictable and uncontrollable stresses such as isolation, silence, stress positions, sound and orientation practices, sense of time deprivation and humiliations can cause anxiety, fear and panic, among others. According to torture, torture expert Megan Bashoglu, their code, they code, are not substantially different from physical torture in terms of the severity of mental pain and suffering they cause, end of quote. This is a point also made in Kuberg, stating that pain can cause a detainee to resist, something often observed in political prisoners who feel they're defending higher ideals and have notably high tolerance to pain, and we, we saw a glimpse of that in Katarina's and Yuri's paper. As Kuberg makes clear, Threats of inflicting pain trigger fears more damaging than the immediate sensation of pain. This has been corroborated by research on post-traumatic stress disorder, showing how the continued experience of fear, hopelessness, and the loss of control can be more detrimental than the experience of physical pain. According to Bashoglu, these practices create a condition of learned helplessness. While they're usually deemed deemed legally as cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, they have in fact more long-term effects than physical torture with regard to post-traumatic stress disorder. Important to note at this point is that these practices work in an accumulated manner and in, in combination rather than each one individually. Coming back to the detention centers of the dictatorship, Cooper explicitly describes the methods outlined above. For instance, the specific mention in a, of isolation in silence and darkness interchange with continuous and often motorized sounds when counter in Bobulinas. Many have suggested that the use of the so-called motorcycle in Bobulinas merely intended to drown the sound of detainees, preventing them from being heard. And yet the motorized sound is, conf is in confined spaces features strongly in Cooper as a major cause of stress, anxiety, panic, physical discomfort, even loss of reality. Also, motorized sound is encountered across geographical areas and detention settings of the period, testifying to its integral role to the torture ritual. By the same token, the continuous electric bell at Piraeus, combined with isolation, constituted a sonic disorientation practice, depriving detainees not just of sleep, but also of a sense of time. It also eradicated any possibility of resistance through thinking. Last but not least, the cutting-edge torture ritual at the Adessa followed closely the techniques detailed in Kuberg. In this context, the use of music instead of sound at the Adessa added extra layers of cultural meanings, reinforcing the process of humiliation and degradation. The connection of these methods with international practices is emphatically made by Virginia Tsuderu in the first torturous trials. So the Rue testified that she had seen the interrogation manual used at the Adessa, which came from a NATO military base in Germany. Important to note here is that the use of sharp sound in so-called brainwashing, as it has been um, used at the Adessa, <coughs> is also mentioned in the book Propaganda by Yorgos Yorgalas, one of the regime's ideologues and a teacher of military academies at the time. <coughs> 
The book was published in 1967, which was the year of a coup. With this in mind, let us now examine the definition of torture put for the Greek case and for the case of Ireland against the UK. Both the 1969 report and the 1978 judgment introduce a grading in the definition of torture which ignores the effects and mechanism of these new scientific methods. In the Greek case, the commission defined torture as inhuman treatment which has a purpose, such as the obtaining of information or confessions or the infliction of punishment. In this definition, suffering is not restricted to physical pain but extends to mental one, and this is an important um, step. However, the focus on purpose ignores the devastating effects of manipulating the captive's environment. Torture specialists Bash W and Reyes argue that, quote, if torture is exposure to helplessness induced by unpredictable and uncontrollable stressors while under the custody and control of others, then all contextual stressors, whether intentional or unintentional, or whether physical or psychological, are part and parcel of the process of torture, end of quote. Indeed, often the stressors may not appear as intentional for victims or perpetrators, and I discussed earlier how music and sound were perceived by some um, as merely wanting to drown their cries. More telling is the testimony of a guard at Guantanamo, Chris Arendt, who noted that it took him a while, or a long while, uh, to understand the damaging effects of these methods because they were not taking out toenails or giving electroshocks to prisoners. A similar view was also expressed to me by another SS soldier, D, stationed there between 1972 and 1973. This definition also misses the fact that the practice of torture is always purposeless. Intelligence agencies state that information obtained under torture is not considered reliable. On the contrary, according to a US, US Army manual, torture hinders the collection of information. Often authorities have all necessary information and yet choose to torture detainees at point made to me by several political prisoners, particularly from the Navy movement. The purposelessness of an, the purposeless nature of torture is eloquently articulated by Jean-Paul Sartre in his introduction of Henri Alec's book, La Question, which uh, deals with um, Algeria. Quote, torture is senseless violence born in fear. The purpose is to force from one tongue, amid its screams and its vomiting up of blood, the secret of everything. Senseless violence, whether the victim talks or whether he dies under his agony, the secret he cannot tell is always somewhere else and out of reach. It is the executioner who becomes Sisyphus. If he puts the question at all, he will have to continue forever." Mm. End of quote. Or, as Judge Gerald Fitzmaurice articulated in his separate opinion to the ruling for the case of Ireland versus the UK, quote, torture is torture, whether its object may be, or even if it has not, torture is torture, whatever its object may be, or even if it has none other than to cause pain, provided it is inflicted by force. The case of Ireland versus the UK introduced an even more problematic definition focusing on the severity of pain and suffering. The main charges included um, teaching the Royal Ulster Constabulary and authorizing five interrogation techniques against 14 IRA prisoners. And I think this is the first time we have a, um, a legal proceeding for this uh, combination of techniques. The techniques used there were hooding, wall standing, exposure to noise, reduced diet, and sleep deprivation. Contrary to the Commission's report, which unanimously deemed these techniques as torture, the court adopted a restricted meaning, noting how these methods amounted only to inhuman and degrading treatment. The judgment was not a unanimous one. Another dissenting voice was by Greek judge Dimitrios Evrigenis, who emphasized the need for a definition that, quote, covered various forms of technologically sophisticated torture. This combination of techniques was condemned in 1997 by the UN Committee Against Torture with regard to complaints by Palestinian detainees against Israel's General Security Service. The UN statement underlined how such methods in their combination constituted torture as defined in Article 1 of the Convention. They have been more recently discussed with regard to interrogation practices in the US centers, detention centers in Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo. To conclude, in this paper, I showed how enhanced interrogation methods present us with a new scientific understanding of torture, which heavily relies on culturally shaped perceptions of what constitutes severe pain and suffering. 
As such, they are not always reflected in rulings and legal definitions of torture. For the Greek case equates mental to physical suffering, its focus on purpose is flawed in grasping this cutting edge approach to captive environment and enhance interrogation techniques. The 1978 judgment is even more problematic with its focus on the severity of suffering. It has been challenged recently or in the last decades by research on torture as well as research on post-traumatic stress disorder. And yet the European Court of Human Rights recently missed a historic opportunity to revise this judgment by rejecting a request submitted by Ireland in 2014. This was based on a folder of declassified files withheld by the UK government during the trial, bringing to mind Justice Evergenis' comment at the time about the UK's absolute wall of silence. What transpires from these files is that the UK had prior knowledge of the severe and long-term effects of the five-point technique interrogation, portrayed in court as minor and short-term. The court's rejection, mostly on technical grounds, was a missed opportunity to set straight the legal shortfalls concerning a scientific method that by design aimed at causing maximum harm while evading international law. As Judge Siofra O'Leary noted in her dissenting opinion, an intrastate application code is not an exercise of a right of action to enforce the applicant state's rights, but an action against an alleged violation of the public order of Europe, end of quote. In this sense, she continued, issues of public interest should also be taken into account along with legal certainty. But the 1978 judgment was referred to by the US government to defend and legitimize its own use of enhanced interrogation techniques in the so-called war on terror, underlines the importance these definitions and judgments hold for public interest as well as for a moral responsibility with regard to uncovering new methods of torture and reinforcing its absolute ban. Thank you. from Pandion University and why his thesis deals with the application of the European Convention on Human Rights in the activities of armed forces, both during peacetime and times of armed conflict. And he's currently appointed as the president of the Athens Military Court. So you have 20 minutes, Mr. Kikos. Before beginning my presentations, I would like to state that given my capacity as member of the judiciary, the usual disclaimer applies, that is to say the views about to be expressed here are solely my own and they don't necessarily represent the attitude of the Greek government or any other public institution. So, in the summer of 1975, only a few days after the first anniversary of the fall of the dictatorship and the restoration of democracy in Greece, Two major trials which took place in Athens marked the beginning of a new era, not only for Greek but for international trust as well. The first one, which was recorded in modern Greek history as the instigator's trial, Vikiton Protetion, and concerned the adjudication of charges brought against the principal actors of the 1967 coup d'etat for the crimes of high treason and mutiny, commenced on the 28th of July before the Athens Court of Appeal. A few days later, on the 7th of August, in the stifling atmosphere of the non conditioned courtroom, began before the Athens permanent court martial, the Orchestra of the Kio, the trial which has been in daily in public memory as the torturer's trial, Ivriki Pombasaniston. The proceedings concerned the adjudication of charges brought against 14 officers and 18 soldiers of non-commissioned rank, all of them having served in units of the Greek military police, ESA, and especially in the notorious Special Interrogation Unit, located in the center of Athens, only a mile from here, where acts of systematic abuse and ill treatment against perceived enemies of the state were rampant almost through the whole duration of the dictatorship. 
For those accustomed to the historical evolution and the role of military justice apparatus in previous circumstances, it was a somewhat surprising or even bizarre development. Military courts, either in their permanent or extraordinary formation, were amply utilized in the turbulent first half of the 20th century, especially during anomalous historical periods, as a means to persecute political opponents. The military regime of 1967 blew new life in their function by means of enacting emergency legislation, deviating from a number of articles of the Constitution, and transferring a broad spectrum of crimes deemed to be directed against public order and the security of the state from military criminal courts, sorry, from ordinary criminal courts to military ones, which by that time consisted almost exclusively of army officers most of them without even elementary legal training, with the exception of the presiding officer and the prosecutor. Members of these courts were not endowed with the constitutional guarantees of personal and functional independence, thus being susceptible to undue pressure and influence by their military and political superiors in the course of the performance of their juridical duties. However, since according to the relevant provisions of the Constitution and the Military Criminal Code they enforced, the perpetrators were in active military service at the time of the commission of the alleged crimes, it was deemed pertinent not to transfer the jurisdiction for this case to common criminal courts, as already had happened in the instigator's case by special constitutional acts. Now, even though Greek constitutional texts since the first in 1822, including the two promulgated by the Junta, but which never entered into force, contained general prohibitions against torture, no special stipulations <coughs> for the prosecution and punishment of the crime of torture had been inserted in the Greek Penal Code. Yeah. Therefore, the prosecuting authority had to rely upon provisions <coughs> of the criminal and military criminal code, which were aching to acts of torture or inhuman and degrading treatment, but undoubtedly not capable of conveying the physical and moral abhorrence of crimes perpetrated. <coughs> as a consequence, the indictment included charges such as abuse of authority, assault and insulting behavior against the superior officer, unconstitutional detention, ordinary and aggravated physical injury, their election of duty, serious physical injury and instigation, and aiding and abetting to the above crimes. The trial was conducted according to the military penal procedure, which is a combination of the penal code and the military penal codes. Evidence <coughs> put on behalf of the prosecution fell into five distinct categories. First, retired officers as to their arrest and treatment from 1969 onwards. Second, students <coughs> arrested after the Athens Law School demonstrations in early 1973. Uh, fourth, students and other persons arrested after the Athens Polytechnics events in, um, in November 73. Uh, also, naval officers arrested after the unsuccessful naval mutiny in May 73. And finally, former SA soldiers, many of whom presented a harrowing picture of the processes of dehumanization to which they had been subjected during their training. The defendants were all members of the Hunda's military police who had served in the Special Interrogation Unit of Athens, the training center, KESA, uh, the period section of KESA, and the military prison in Attica. Now, the outcome of the first trial, though not flawless as regards the evaluation of evidence and application of the relevant uh, substantive and procedural provisions, was held as a breakthrough in the context of the then nascent field of what in later years became known as transitional justice. Officers responsible for the administration of the ATSA were convicted to long terms of incarceration, <coughs> either as direct or indirect perpetrators. On the other hand, the verdict was criticized as a slap on the wrist for those accused, non-commissioned officers, and conscripts. Some of them were found innocent, and those who were found guilty were convicted into short imprisonment terms, which in most cases were suspended. Exculpatory arguments put forward by the defense lawyers invoking obeying superior orders 
were not uh, accepted, they were rejected unanimously. Yet in the case of 10 defendants, the above defense was indirectly accepted under the guise of excusable error of law. Moreover, the defense of duress exercised upon the reserve members of the SA, especially through the brutal procedures of training and indoctrination, was accepted by the court as mitigating circumstance, which allowed the imposition of considerably lenient suspended sentences. Regretfully, by the time of the trial, the provisions of military criminal procedure released military courts from the duty to provide sufficient reasoning for their judgments. As a consequence, the exact legal and factual underpinnings of the verdict and the acceptance or rejection of defenses may be only indirectly deduced through the overall evaluation of the proceedings. Now, a second torture trial took also place before the same military court between the 13th of October and 9th of December 1975. In this trial, 37 defendants, 13 of which had already been tried during the first trial, though on different counts, faced similar charges concerning crimes committed during the last year of the dictatorship. In this case, the court comprised of different judges. 11 of the defendants were acquitted on several grounds, and the penalties imposed on those convicted were significantly lighter. This spectacular backsliding, only three months, and only three months, sorry, was attributed mainly to the fact that the verdict of the instigator's trial was announced on the 23rd of August, with the imposition of the death penalty for three defendants, almost immediately commuted to life imprisonment, and life imprisonment for several others. One might suppose that the gravity of penalties imposed upon the instigators of the coup d'etat weighed heavily upon the subsequent judgment by creating an impression that justice had already been served through the severe punishment of the principal culprits. Thus, it was time to look ahead, given the fragility of the recently restored democratic regime, which might be undermined by the perpetuity of what a certain excellence of the state apparatus was considered as revenge justice. Let us not forget that already in February 1975, there was a thwarted uh, coup attempt, the so-called uh, pyjama coup attempt, because the main conspirators were arrested by the Ministry of Defense at their homes before going to their units. And uh, there was a great uh, apprehension that it might be uh, it might take place one more uh, because the main uh, purpose was not to seize power but uh, to force the Karmanese government to grant general amnesty to the torturers and of course to the principal culprits of uh, the coup d'etat. So the acquittal of several defendants in subsequent trials, especially members of the security police, on several factual and legal grounds caused public outrage and reinvigorated the public debate for the promulgation of a more drastic and effective substantive and procedural legal frame for the prosecution and punishment of torture. However, despite assurances provided by the Greek government to the Council of Europe, that it was planning to introduce special legislative measures for the criminalization of acts of torture already in 1976. It was only in 1984, a few weeks after the signature by Greece of the UN Convention Against Torture, that the Hellenic Parliament approved on the 28th of November, Law 1500. Articles defining and criminalizing acts of torture and inhuman and degrading treatment were inserted by the provisions of the above law in the chapter of the criminal code including crimes against the democratic regime. By that time, the late professor of criminal law in Athens University, Georgios Alexandros Mangakis, who was himself harshly persecuted and tortured by the junta, held the office of the Secretary of State for Justice. New legislation was received with enthusiasm mainly by the civil society and the academia. I remember myself uh, as a first year student in Thessaloniki University and the exaltation of both academic staff and the students that this was the first country worldwide to enact specialized legislation for torture. Though it with caution by the courts and law enforcement agencies, although never expressed in clear terms, 
there was skepticism whether the severity of the criminal and administrative penalties prescribed for torture, that is to say incarceration from 5 to 20 years and dishonorable discharge from public office, might bring about detrimental consequences upon the morale of law enforcement agents and thus hamper the effective performance of their duties. Moreover, a systematic evaluation of the jurisprudence of the Greek criminal courts bear witness to the conclusion that, despite legal definitions and the shift of vulnerability focus to groups like persons under police custody and undocumented migrants, torture as a legal, historical, and cultural perception for a significant portion of the legal and juridical community is still entangled with the brutal, methodical, and systematic behavior recorded during the torturous trials of 1975-76. Therefore, any course of conduct that seems to fall short of these standards is usually classified as human degrading treatment, a misdemeanor which is punishable with more lenient and usually commutable imprisonment terms. In some instances, although all of the criteria for the classification of an incident as torture, or at least in human degrading treatment, are fulfilled, prosecuting authorities tend to apply the common provisions of assault and physical injury which usually requires the prior filing of a criminal complaint by the alleged victim. And in the absence thereof, which sometimes is the case, no further steps are taken and the complaint is rejected. Now, the fact that only one case of final conviction for torture by Greek courts has been recorded the last 35 years after Law 1500 was enacted, is perhaps indicative of the validity of the above arguments. It is also worth mentioning that even this case, which concerned the torturing of a juvenile arrested by the police with the use of electric shocks, led to a finding by the European Court of Human Rights against Greece. It's the case of Sidiropoulos and Papakostas versus Greece, which was delivered on the 25th of January 2018. In particular, the court found that given the leniency of the penalties imposed to the officer found guilty for torture, the criminal and disciplinary system as applied in the present case had proved to be seriously lacking in rigor and incapable of having a deterrent effect to ensure the effective prevention of torture. The outcome of the proceedings against the police officer had not provided appropriate redress for the breach of the right enshrined in Article 3 of the Convention. Thus, there had been a violation of Article 3. Another important deficiency concerning the effective application of legislation against torture is inextricably linked with the definition of the crime of torture in Article 137 of the Code, which at least until recently diverged essentially from the definition enshrined in Article 1 of the UN Convention, and formed the reason for Greece being placed under the scrutiny of Council of Europe organs. In particular, the Committee of Ministers, in the decisions of 7 December 2017, noted the establishment of a committee tasked with examining whether the definition of torture in Greek law is compatible with the definition of Article 1 of UN Convention, and thus raised to keep the Council of Ministers informed about further relevant developments. The Council of Ministers' focus on the definition of the crime of torture in Greek law reflects the European Court of Human Rights judgment in the case of Zontul versus Greece, which was rendered in the seventh, on the 17th of January 2012, which originated from a trial before national military courts. In this case, the court found that the definition of torture according to Greek penal law is incompatible with Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. The requirement that treatment be planned, seriously and systematic, method of many, according to the Greek translation, for it to constitute torture, means that certain acts that fall within the ambit of the definition of torture under the, convention, uh, under the European Convention are not considered as such under Greek law. For the same reason, the above definition of the crime of torture is incompatible with the UN Convention. Therefore, there is an absent need to overhaul the existing criminal law and practice and to remedy existing shortcomings, such as the one concerning the definition of torture in Article 137. Moreover, the above definition does not include in its ambit torture inflicted 
at the instigation or with the consent or acquiescence of a public official or a person acting in an official capacity which is part of the CAT definition of torture. As a result, cases of torture outsourcing, that is to say performed by a person who does not bear the capacity of state agency, other than instigation, incitement or toleration of a public official, are not covered by the stipulations in force. Although the introduction of new criminal code provided a unique opportunity for Greece to fulfill the pledge for a comprehensive rectification of the above deficiencies, the relevant articles, save for certain technical modifications, remained unaltered. Moreover, according to the content of the initial draft of the code, which was subsequently modified, the crime of torture had been declassified as a crime against the democratic regime and reclassified as a crime concerning the proper administration of public service. Thus, the definition of torture and inhuman and degrading treatment in Greek legislation continue to be compatible with the one contained to the UN Convention. This rather paradoxical state of affairs was finally remedied by the Ministry of Justice with the approval by the Parliament and enactment on November 18th, that is to say only three weeks ago, of Law 4637, which modifies the relevant articles of the Criminal Code, replacing the term methodical with the term intentional, thus removing a serious obstacle for the classification of the acts of torture. It is also expressly stipulated that acts of torture are equally punishable, even without the purpose of extraction of confession, punishment, or renouncement of a certain ideology, provided that the choice of the victim was based on racial, national, ethnic, religious, sexual, disability, or gender-related criteria. Yet, the new law does not include any provisions concerning torture outsourcing as described above, nor exceptions from the application of the statute of limitation barriers, as already been noticed by both the UN Committee Against Torture and the European Court of Human Rights. Now, to conclude, uh, the torture strikes of 1975, despite certain controversial aspects, constituted a watershed and a very important precedent in the fight against impunity for heinous crimes committed by agents of oppressive regimes worldwide. As underlined by in the Amnesty International's report in the first torturous trial, any democratic government that succeeded the Junta would inherit a highly complex political and legal environment, and any new government's task of censoring the torturers of the old regime would have to take the circumstances of the day into account. It is perhaps for this additional reason that the momentum generated in the immediate aftermath of trials did not suffice for more timely and comprehensive adoption of the pertinent normative and institutional framework. As a result, the jurisprudence of the Greek courts, with certain remarkable exceptions, reveals a rather cautionary approach which, in certain instances, seems to reverberate the reluctances and limitations of the 1975 trials. The monitoring of international bodies, such as the Council of Europe organs, and the proper application of the new legislative provisions constitute factors likely to bring about the necessary changes so that torture in all of its forms and manifestations and regardless of circumstances will be perceived as a phenomenon fundamentally compatible with modern democratic societies. Thank you very much.